Um, all right, I'd like to proceed now to the public comment section of our program today. Um, to get in line for comment, uh, please select the raised hand function in Zoom. If you're calling in, you can hit uh, star nine. Uh, please note, everybody should note that this meeting is being recorded and then if you make a public comment, your name or phone number may be displayed as part of the recording. If you would like uh, to make a comment, um, do so now. We'll take a minute to see how many people are in the queue. And based on that, uh, I'll make a decision about how long each person has to comment. Um, I really will ask that you respect uh, that time period so we can hear from as many people as possible. Uh, while we're waiting for people to line up, uh, I wanna acknowledge the letters that the committee reviewed from a class at Bishop O'Dowd High School in Oakland about the committee's consideration of the death penalty. Um, we really appreciate their uh, engagement in the committee's work and we're very impressed uh, by what they said and, um, and their activism, thank you. Um, I also wanna acknowledge voluminous letters from people in CDCR that have been submitted to the committee by uh, Californians United for Responsible Budget or CURB. I expect we'll be hearing about some of those letters during public comment. Um, with that, uh, Rick or uh, Tom, who's, who's managing the queue? I've got it. And am I to, supposed to be able to see that? I guess, yes. Yes. And are there 28 hands raised? Is that? Yeah, that's accurate. All right, I don't see the, oh, here, give me a second. I got it. Okay, given the large number, this is the largest number I think that we've had of people um, wanting to comment and we really do appreciate the comment. I'm gonna say a couple things. I'm gonna limit it to uh, one minute each. Um, please try to keep your comment as succinct as possible. If you would like to make uh, more detailed comments to us, please do email us. We really collect and, e and read those and we uh, categorize them. And in some ways they're a better way to get um, your substantive point across. Um, so with that, I will, um, we're gonna dig in and we're gonna start with uh, Yolanda Navarrete. Welcome back. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, chair and committee. My name is Yolanda Navarrete and I'm representing Drop L Wap and Curb. I'm gonna re read a letter on behalf of Mr. Kil Sent, um, L Wap sentences cause great feeling of grief, mental and physical stress. Um, I see the sadness in my family's eyes every time they visit me and get ready to leave. My wife and kids have said that they understand people have to pay for their crimes. But when a person is truly changed, where is the opportunity to earn their freedom with an LWAP sentence? Where is the humanity in sentencing someone to such slow and torturous death? A person with an LWAP sentence remains in prison for decades, getting old, waiting to die from the death, from this death sentence. Receiving news from family members that our father, mother, wife, husband, sister has passed away, and the list goes on and on, is the worst pain. I accepted Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, in my life over 10 years ago, and like most persons serving LWAP sentences, we spend our time working on being better people, changing the way we used to think, feel, and act. Feeling deep remorse and shame for the victims of our crimes, I cry, but permanently banishing us from society, the opportunity of a meaningful atonement and redemption that embodies recognition of the harms that we cause. I would like lawmakers to set 20 to 25 year time frame for all LWAPs. Respectfully. Thank you, Ms. Navarrete. Uh, no problem. Thank you. I appreciate I and I appreciate that you're a a, a regular uh, with our committee. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Crispy. Hi, I'm Crispy, and I'll be reading. Uh, Hi, I'm Crispy, and hi. Uh, hi, and I'm reading a letter from Robert George. Uh, my name is Robert George, and I am an inmate serving life sent life without the possibility of parole sentence currently incarcerated at the Chino State Prison in Chino, California. On the 23rd of this month, 
I will have served 41 years and five months of my life without parole sentence. In these past almost 42 years of my incarceration, I have lost my whole entire immediate family, either to death or to the out of sight, out of touch or out of mind syndrome. Although I have made an effort numerous times to find through different kinds of magazines, newspapers, or different websites on the internet, attempting to reach out to pen pals for both physical as well as emotional contact through visiting and letters. These have always been short-lived, no matter how well-intentioned. I am not even allowed to go in front of the parole board to give voice and show my efforts of change to be the man I am now, or to show the accomplishments I've made to change and to enrich my life from the person I was when I was first incarcerated, obtaining my high school diploma, achieving an associate's degree in business psychology or the numerous self-help groups I have completed and received certification. It seems they're not the very slightest care or concern about any of that when it comes to an inmate serving life without parole. Thank you for your time and for listening to my personal views regarding this subject. Thank you especially for all your hard work and efforts to change the laws concerning long-term incarceration. It is very deeply appreciated by all the true lifers. Thank you, Crispy. We really appreciate it. Uh, Lauren Batten. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you so much. My name is Lauren and I'll be reading written testimony on behalf of Lester Polk. I'm 18 years old. I committed a robbery that resulted in a death of a human being. I intended to pay for my crime, but nearly 30 years later, I am still paying. One of the unjust problematic things about my extreme sentence is that despite my record, I was constantly housed with others with extreme sentences who did not have a desire for any kind of transformation because there was no hope of release. What lawmakers need to know is life without parole is one thing, but life without hope is deadly. Extreme sentences take away hope and increase destruction. Why should one change in an environment where neither the staff nor inmates respect it? Since the advent of LWOP, crime has not been deterred, but has instead increased, swelling our prison systems to a breaking point. Crime needs to be addressed, but sentences that cross to harmful vengeance miss the mark. Harmful vengeance miss the mark, excuse me. It is time to move beyond the decades old tough on crime, soft on crime rhetoric to being smart on crime. How many life sentences can a person do? Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and you know, thank you all for uh, reading these letters. They really are meaningful and for also for observing our time, time limit. And I hope that you'll relay back that we do really appreciate uh, hearing their voices. Uh, with that, uh, Sasha Stahl. Hi, uh, my name is Sasha and I'm reading on behalf of Javier E. Martinez. This might be longer than a minute, so you can just cut me off when um, need be. I'm writing to share my experience with you about how it's been for me serving life without the possibility of parole. I've been in prison for 25 years now. When I first got arrested, I never really thought I had a chance of ever going home. I had this belief before I was even convicted. I, I really didn't have an education to be able to understand anything about the legal process. I went through the frustration of not knowing how to help myself or even prepare myself for what was to come. This caused a big strain between me and my support system. I pushed a lot of people away and I made my situation worse because I cannot communicate my frustrations. My support system family also grew frustrated with me because they could not understand my own frustration. I did not know how to communicate with them, how they could help me rehabilitate myself. Once I got convicted and sent to prison, there was no opportunities for me to receive an education or rehabilitation. I just sat in a cell all day. I recall being told in 1998 that receiving a GED was a priority for people that are going home. I had no incentive or opportunity to educate myself. It discouraged me and that affected my self-esteem. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you there. I realize that these are long letters. I hope that they are all submitted to the committee in, the, in their full uh, text. Um, I'm not saying that we don't like hearing the voices because I, I think that it is especially helpful and powerful, but please do make sure that they're submitted. Um, Liz, and if you could help me pronounce your last name, I'd appreciate it. Hi, Liz Atkins Pattinson, thank you. And I'm a member Hi. of Growing Up for Racial Justice, Surge Bay Area, and I'll be reading the powerful written testimony on behalf of Arthur Bermudez. Greetings to you, 
um, and staff, allow me a moment to introduce myself. My name is Arthur Bermudez and I'm 44 years old serving a sentence of life without the opportunity of parole and have been incarcerated for 22 years. This letter is in regards to offer some insight and an opinion on being sentenced and serving an LWAP sentence. Being sentenced to extreme sentences such as LWAP can have a severe impact on the mental state of the individual being sentenced, their family, as well as the jury. It's a ripple effect. The the sentence nearly destroyed my family. Two examples, my sister who was nine years old at the time had to attend counseling um, and one day on vacation visiting Alcatraz, she had a breakdown. Another example, my mother and father argued so much over finances that they almost divorced. My incarceration has been a major impact on their finances from attorney fees to canteen and package money to funds for visiting. The toll it's taken on my family weighs on me every day and I know they worry for me having to be incarcerated for the rest of my life and the weight that that has on them. Lawmakers need to start thinking about rethinking their stance on extreme sentences. They are harmful in so many ways and its impacts are far and wide. They can maybe give LWOPs an opportunity to go to the board after serving a set amount of years, or maybe they can give us an opportunity based on behavior. LWOP sentences can breed a sense of hopelessness because there is nothing to look forward to and no light at the end of the tunnel. If showing- okay, Liz, I'm, I'm sorry to break in, but I mean, I I know that these are letters that are really heartfelt and people want to be able to share all of their thoughts with us. Um, so again, we will, we will read them, I promise. They will get sorted and, and put in uh, the record in full. Um, and, and I think that reading them aloud is, is helpful, but I wanna get through as many as possible. So I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, you. Satina Green. You can hear me now? Yes, did I, did I pronounce your name correctly? Pronounce my wife's name correctly. My name is uh, Stephen Green. I'm com a commuted uh, life without uh, person. I was, I had, was sentenced to life without in, in uh, 1992, served almost 28 years and was commuted by Governor Brown in 2018. And like my, uh, I'm also like to say that I'm very happy that Professor Chen has been um, uh, another member to this committee, a great choice. And I would like to also um, uplift the, the, the voice of uh, uh, Cruz Avila. And he says, greetings. First, I'd like to thank you for the efforts regarding prison reform, specifically LWAP issues. I come before you as an LWAP person, uh, plus three years, and I've been incarcerated for over 25 years for a murder I did not commit. And due to California's unjust sentencing guidelines, I was convicted of a felony murder in which there was never an intent to kill or harm anyone. Um, being from Sacramento, where I was convicted, the DA automatically dies petitions and makes decisions come from a higher court to refuse acknowledgement of the SB 1437 intentions, where it's pretty, pretty, pretty clear cut in my case. Instead of applying the bill the way it was intended, my family and myself are left in limbo and must proceed with the audacious process through the appellate court. Not to mention, I was 20 years old at the time of the crime, and if it wasn't for my sentence, I would qualify for all the youth offender statues and would most likely be home with my kids and my family. It should also be noted that I have no prior arrest or criminal record or history. And due to the sentence of LWAP, uh, I have no, incentive, uh, no incentives coming, whereas other people receive milestones for good behavior and credit earning. And Mr. Credit Green, Mr. Green, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you off too, I apologize. Um, oh, no problem, I understand. Thank you and, and congratulations and um, thank you for participating. Yes, thank um, you. Mary Lou Pettyway. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Mary Lou Petaway and I'll be reading written testimony on behalf of Virginia Backlund. Being sentenced to life without parole makes me unvaluable to rehabilitate as a human being. This affected me by losing out and being the mother I should be to my children. CDCR is about rehabilitation. Being sentenced to life without parole means that any rehabilitation or changes I make in my life mean nothing because ultimately it means I was sentenced to a slow death sentence. I would like to see the sentence of life without parole abolished because it is a draconian sentence. Yes, I committed a horrific act that brought me to prison. However, as all human beings change, so will I with rehabilitation. I'm human, not trash. Thank you for your consideration and time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, please excuse me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, Gav Gavrila? 
Yes, and like last month, um, you can call me G. All right, G. Okay, thanks. I'm the coordinator of the San Francisco Amnesty International chapter and repeating myself from last month, it is critical that we abolish the death penalty and LWAP as they're closely related and more often than not, they result in the same outcome, death by incarceration. There's often painful dissonance between abolitionists, defense attorneys and impacted people when discussing LWAP and the death penalty. Can we please listen to impacted people and their loved ones and understand that LWAP is not a desired next step for at least anyone I know on death row. We have to rethink this puzzle. We're Californians, man, let's think different. At the very least, let's please emulate the European models. It is agonizing to conceive of prison age versus outside age. As I said last month, I'm dear friends with Kevin Cooper and Jarvis Masters, both on California death row with overwhelmingly compelling cases of innocence for all, and they've been there for almost four decades each. Jarvis was in solitary confinement for 22 years and his health was and is impacted by that cruel and punishment. Just wanna finish off. I'm hoping that the committee will talk about solitary at one meeting soon. And just to repeat myself, to be derivative of myself again, there has been another death since our last meeting. And um, I just wanna end on that note that this is, this is unconscionable. Thank you. Thank you, G. And we really do repeat, uh, appreciate the folks who uh, are with us for multiple times. Uh, Joanne Shear, I believe you've also uh, testified before us before. Yes. Uh, hi, Chair. Um, thank you so much for um, for your panel hosts and, and what you're talking and for this. Um, I'm the sentence we process having these types of uh, crimes before come before them in court. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Hold, hold hold on one second, Joanne. Okay. okay. Why don't you start? Why don't you start over? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm here on behalf of my only child serving life without parole under felony murder special circumstances. And I, I'm reading a letter from Jeffrey Milo Burks from Corcoran State Prison. I was sentenced to life without parole 31 years ago. If the choice had been mine, I would have chosen my place on death row instead of LWAP. Death row prisoners aren't abandoned. Lawyers and anti-death penalty advocates clamor to keep condemned people from lethal injection. LWAP prisoners are left to face their long and agonizing death alone with no legal help or support because LWAP is not viewed as a death sentence. Waking up in prison, an electric fence surrounding your world with no hope of changing that dark future is unfathomable. Hope rarely survives the daily onslaught. Many fall into despair, turning on themselves through drugs, alcohol, and violence, destroying what they could be in exchange for someone they would never be if they still had hope of freedom. LWAP slaughters hopes, dreams, and aspirations. My 89-year-old mother has throat cancer. COVID in distance will prevent me from seeing her alive again. Thank you so much, and thank you for your consideration and um, your help to change LWAP and the death penalty. Thank, thank you, Ms. Shear. We, we really appreciate your contribution. Uh, MJ King? Thank you. Uh, my name is MJ King, and I will be reading um, testimony, um, written testimony on behalf of Stacey Dyer. I'm writing about the extreme sentencing of life without parole. I have been incarcerated for almost 20 years, and no matter how much I have changed, I still have yet to be given a second chance. For these 20 years, my family has suffered with me being in here. My children were ages one and three when I got incarcerated. Today, they are 20 and 22. Their struggles have been enormous and infinite. The impact of my incarceration will continue to take a toll on my loved ones for the rest of our lives. My parents lost their home, their health, and respect due to my crime and trying to get me out of prison. What has been unfair is that I do not receive the same opportunities as others. I have done all I can to rehabilitate myself and grow as a human being. Still, I cannot earn a day before the Board of Commissioners to be deemed suitable for parole. What I would like to see is a chance for all LWAPs to have a chance to go to the board after 25 years. Let the commissioners do their job of deciding who is safe to reenter society. Thank you all for your time and effort, Stacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. King. We appreciate it. Uh, Maria Montez Arvizu, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes. Thank well, you. Thank you um, for having me. Um, I'm a volunteer with California Coalition. When prisoners 
and I'll be reading written testimony on behalf of Jose Esquivas. So greetings, my name is Jose Esquivas. On April 20, 23rd, 1997, I was arrested for first degree murder with a special circumstance and 10 months later, I was found guilty and sentenced to LWAP. Receiving an LWAP sentence affected my family and myself very much to the point that I became bitter, angry, full of hate and antisocial. And overall, I isolated myself from every single person including my family. My parents were separated at that time of my arrest, that I, so I became the father figure to my young siblings and the provider as well. At the time of my incarceration, my family was devastated and my siblings too young to understand why their older brother was no longer around, felt abandoned, sad, sad afraid, and alone. A person is sent to prison to become rehabilitated and eventually live a productive life upon re-entering re back into society but a person sentenced to LWAP is not given the same opportunity. For many years, those that were sent to prison became a lost cause. So the prisons that I was shipped off to LWAPs were not allowed to re receive vocational training or work on a good paying job. The more I was denied access to self-improvement, the more bitter I became. I've been incarcerated for 24 years now. I was 18 years old when I committed my life crime. When CDCR did not give me what I needed to rehabilitate myself, I went out looking for it myself. I know change is possible. I am not a lost cause. I became involved in many different types of self, self help correspondence courses, became involved in self help group programs that the prison started to offer, such as life support groups, partnership, alternatives to violence project, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I was a facilitator, mentor for prep. I'm, so, I'm, sorry, to, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I really uh, do appreciate it. And, I, and I, I should have cut you off on saying I'm not a lost cause because I thought that was particularly powerful. Yeah. But thank you. And please make sure the letter is submitted. Yeah. Um, thank Gwen, you ja time. Gwen Jackson. OK, can you hear me? I can. OK, thank you. Uh, the work you're doing is very important. This is uh, my first time uh, listening in and I really appreciate it. I just wanted to share that um, I have a son who is serving a 57 year to life sentence uh, uh, for attempted murder, uh, you know, due to the stacking that you were talking about during your meeting. And uh, as new laws are put on the books, our hopes are renewed, you know, uh, but it doesn't take long before we realize that the intentions of the voters are seldom realized, uh, you know, because of the lack of accountability of all the stakeholders and how to um, uh, get these laws processed within the prison sy system. Um, you know, the youthful offender uh, law should have benefited my son. Prop 57 didn't because he had a violent crime. He received a recommendation, the 1170D from the warden and we don't know where that is, it's just languishing somewhere. So um, the work you're doing is important uh, and I uh, like to help any way I can. So just, con um, you know, we just like to see those people on the list, that 1170 list uh, somehow get um, their names processed and hopefully come home. Ms. Jackson, we couldn't we couldn't agree more. To get a recommendation from the warden on 1170D is the first and the, the hardest step, and it does not come easily. So uh, you should be proud and hopeful about that. So 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 thank you, um, Mary Moreno. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. First and foremost, thank you very much for this opportunity and for all your panel and yourself, Chair. Um, I. I just want to make some observations um, that um, you know I I just um, saw yesterday regarding some of the comments that were made by your panelists. I just feel that you know for me it was very traumatic to just hear um, some of the comments that were made yesterday because I observed several people and heard that all these people that have such um, an influence and the authority over the outcome of someone's um, lives um, seems to be so, um, or lack, I should say, um, trauma informed. And it, it's just scary, just the thought alone to see that I heard. And I don't wanna by any means uh, minimize, especially I believe it was Mr. Uh, Mike Reynolds, um, I believe who spoke about losing his daughter by all means, I never wanna minimize his pain, but I do wanna say that's, that as a survivor of 
violence, there is nothing more healing and powerful that, that causes more satisfaction than forgiveness. And the message that we continue to send out here that people are um, irredeem irredeemable and not worthy of another opportunity, which uh, sometimes it's a first opportunity, to be honest, um, is just something that we really need to reconsider and think about and, and, and take a really hard look at what we are you know, bringing to the table here because all I heard yesterday was a, a need for vengeance and punishment and little about rehabilitation and the whole purpose of what incarceration is really supposed to mean. And um, well, thank you, Ms. Thank Ms. You. Marine, Marine. I really appreciate that. And I think that if you, uh, we were all, I think struck by uh, Mr. Reynolds um, testimony, a, but also, I think I was at least encouraged by testimony from, you know, the secretary of corrections, the head of the prison system, who I think shares your general uh, outlook about uh, encouraging, incentivizing rehabilitation. So um, I just wanted to make that comment. All right. The next person is an email address cngrams65 at gmail. Oh, yeah, that's me. I'm Caitlin, um, part of Initiate Justice, reading a letter from Roman Galafante III. Um, and it will go over the one minute, so you could just cut me off. My name is Roman Galafante III. I've been incarcerated in the state prison system since May 8, 1989, serving a life without possibility of parole LWAP sentence. I've not included... I have not incurred any violence and or serious rule violations during this time. Literally for the first... Um, two thirds of my incarceration, just being LWAP, I uh, would not be considered for any groups that would um, assist in rehabilitation. These opportunities were given to those with parole dates. LWAP um, inmates were considered, and I quote, the living dead, which is quite shocking for me to read. I walk the avenue of seeking core courses and outside education, some of which I paid for uh, with a meager prison salary of 37 cents an hour. I was one of the fortunate inmates that had from um, family support to help me pay the tuition um, that my 30 cents an hour could not pay for. Despite Caitlin, is, I think that's your name, I'm sorry. I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut you off, but I, I am also struck by the um, fortitude of folks who have no hope um, or sentenced to sentences that should, that seem to communicate no hope, but yet uh, work to better themselves and, and find ways to um, seek transformation on, nonetheless. So I'm continually impressed as well by folks like that. Um, Nancy uh, Haight, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, I'm Nancy Haight. I am from Ventura County. I am an attorney, a criminal defense attorney, um, a former public defender. I've been a capital habeas uh, appointed counsel. So I speak of this from inside the system. Um, I have frequently pondered the complexity of sentencing law. And uh, sometimes I've just found myself wondering if the lawmakers understood the cruelty and the finality that the law imposed. Uh, I will say, listening to this whole session today, I am encouraged because I see that there is hope and I see that many of you are looking for um, rehabilitation rather than retribution. Um, I'd like to say that I do completely uh, join your staff in the recommendation that the death penalty should be repealed. Um, something that people outside the system don't see is that the death penalty really corrupts the justice system, the criminal justice system, simply by the fact that there are so many branches of the justice system that are dedicated. So we have OSPD and HCRC and the attorney general's office and indiv individual district attorney's offices and the whole bunch of experts that go along with all of that. Not to, men not to mention the California Supreme Court. I think that Justice Moreno says that he sat on 200 death penalty cases, which is- And, and a, a survey that I did a few years ago showed that something on the order of 60% of the Cal uh, California Supreme Court's time 
is dedicated to these cases. Yeah. Now, after Prop 66, we've moved these back to superior courts. They're causing their own problem there. So I, I, I join them in the recommendation to repeal the death penalty. I certainly join everyone and thank all of you on this committee and everyone who's on the line. I want to thank you all for your support um, to abolish LWAP. I thank mean, you, Nan Nancy. Thank you very much. I, 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 we really appreciate it, and especially the, the shout out to our, our hardworking staff. So thank you. Uh, Lee O. Uh, Not really. Hi. Hi again. Yeah. So can you hear me at all? Yes, I think we can hear you now. Okay, th thank you, yeah. So basically what I just wanted to touch on was the juvenile strikes on the three strike law and the Prop 57 use. My son got 72 years to life due to the juvenile strikes. His maximum under adult system would have been 21 years to life, but the judge instead tripled him up on the basically two juvenile strikes he had, he tripled him up on second degree murder so they gave him 15, tripled up to 45. Then he gave him a consecutive life sentence, 25 years to life on a third strike for what was uh, dissuading a witness, which is a not, which was actually nonviolent, only serious. So they gave him 72 years to life, one year knife enhancement, one year prison prior. So he actually got 72 years to life, 50 extra years due to juvenile strikes. And the, as the judge was saying earlier, the Romero motion covers that really in high emotion cases, the Romero motion isn't even filed until after trial is concluded or before, but there's a lot of emotion in the murder cases and they're never going to grant those uh, Romero motion, you know? Lee, Lee, thank you. Rare Romero motions are very hard uh, to win frequently. If, if you don't mind, oh, all right, you're gone. Uh, the, the 70, you know, the, the, these uh, extreme sentences where you get parole after what I'm going to presume is the beyond natural lifespan of his son is just another area that the stacking, um, we talked about virtual life without parole. Uh, Christine Clifford. Christine, are you there? Mike, can we go to the next person? Um, yes, Christine, if you can get back in line, we'll try to get, get to you if we can. Uh, Tatiana uh, Ettenberger. Hi, my name is Tatiana Ettenberger, and I will be reading testimony on behalf of Andrew Lee Grange. Greetings. By way of introduction, my name is Andrew Lee Grange. I'm a 61-year-old youth offender who was formally condemned to a term of life without the possibility of parole. On November 21st, 2018, then Governor Brown granted my application for commutation and I was given a term of 27 to life. I was originally arrested on June 5th, 1980 for the murder of Howard Witkin. At the time of Mr. Witkin's murder and my subsequent arrest, I was 20 years old. I was tried, convicted and sentenced to LWAP in September of 1981. I've seen many changes in the nearly 41 years I've been confined. The so-called pendulum of rehabilitation took decades to swing in the direction of positive human change, but I'm grateful to see firsthand that not only has change been initiated, but it is progressing. The idea of restorative justice has been around for as long as I've been incarcerated, but the possibility for positive change has only gained momentum because the truth behind the industrial prison for profit complex has come to light. The far reaching ripple effect of harm can be catastrophic and I know all too well the damage such harm can and does cause. I'm fully responsible and accountable for the harm I've caused. Not only did I murder a man whom I did not even know, but my poor decisions and actions brought years of discord, pain, misery to many people. Mr. Whitkin's family, his community, as well as my own family were impacted by the choices I made. Tatiana, can I just ask you a quick question? You said that from the letter that the person who's, if you could say his name, and then you said he was granted parole, I mean, he's granted commutation by Governor Brown and given a parole sentence, is that correct? Yes, his name is Andrew Lee Granger. Okay. Um, and it was on November 21st, 2018, given a term of 27 to life. Thank you. Um, Donna? Am I on? Donna, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm Donna Doolin-Larson and I'm co-founder of, of Families of San Quentin. 
and also facilitator for the Stop San Quentin Death Row Working Group. I have two bullet points. One is, first, I'm the mother of a factually innocent son on death row who's been there for 27 years, and we're still trying to find our way through the court system. And with that, I want to say thank you to all the participants and to you, the chair, and for recognizing there needs to be a change. My second bullet point is in 20, 2000, I'm sorry, in the year 2000, I went to Europe to study their penal code and their judicial system. I visited six prisons while I was there. I was interested in the rehab because at that point in, in the year 2000, the R on CDC, R, became the rehab, and I wanted to know about it. I learned a lot, and thank you to the, the gentleman yesterday that was there. I wanted to hug him. And um, I just know that we need change both inside and outside. And these people must see that we're working very hard for them. So abolish the death penalty and drop LWAP. That's my stance. And thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. And for what you do, we really appreciate it. Um, the, next call, the next caller is from California's Coalition for Women Prisoners. Hi, thank you, Courtney Hansen, CCWP, Hi, as you said, hello. Really appreciate the issues you're addressing and it's heavy and it's very close to my heart. Um, one of my best friends is serving 36 to life and it's entirely enhancements. Um, I'm gonna read an excerpt from a letter actually from Susie Adams who's serving life without parole. Not only was I sentenced to LWAP, I also have three life sentences. I was sentenced at the age of 48. This is a sentence that can extinguish any glimmer of hope. Lives in prison matter, we matter. LWAPs work hard at their rehabilitation. We take group, we learn and grow. Then we become facilitators, we go to school, we get our GEDs, we continue, we go to college, we start working on our BAs. We make goals and we accomplish them. We are mentors, mothers, sisters, daughters, not only to our family, but to our community. I made a mistake and then I changed my whole life. With my education and resources that I now have, I can honestly say if I paroled, I could work and help in a community, my community. LWAPs are the hardest working group in prison, yet we are not recognized. We are the backbone of the prison. We can be this too in our communities. Let us go, it is our time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Uh, Jane Grant. Yes, thank you. Um, I am going to be reading testimony on behalf of Robert Ibarra, who's serving LWAP at Calpatria. The extreme sentence of LWAP has affected my family by shattering any hope of me having a chance at a prosperous future. No matter how good my conduct is, LWAP inmates have no chance to be recognized as productive people who can change the world we live in. But that's what we're striving to do, to better ourselves in here in the prayerful hope that we can earn a chance to show that we can be assets to our community. An LWAP sentence looms heavily over us by its overuse by judges across the state, denying them discretion to impose a parole eligible sentence. It's not justice, but injustice that is being imposed on a person like me who didn't actually do the crime, but was just in the presence of a crime being committed. Is sentencing me to LWAP fair? No. Doing my family a disservice? Yes. For too long, DAs are allowed to reign over sentencing and wrongly sentence individuals. We need a change of direction. If CDCR truly wants to give inmates the chance to rehabilitate, this chance should extend to the LWAP community as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Coranter. We appreciate it. Uh, Marion? Good afternoon, everybody. This is Marion Wickard. Panel members, first, I would like to uh, congratulate you for your continued support for those with determinate sentences being reduced. It is greatly appreciated. As I have said many times, my husband Tommy is serving a determinate sentence for 57 years for voluntary manslaughter. 35 of those are enhancements. He's 54 years old. He's been down 19 and a half years without any disciplinary actions. He was referred for an 1170D1 by A.W. Albritton and Warden Broomfield for exceptional behavior. He has not heard a word back from Secretary Allison or her staff. So basically having a determinate sentence unless he is granted parole under the elderly parole, 
he is serving an LWAP sentence for voluntary manslaughter. We must support shorter sentences. We must support restorative justice and humanity. Tommy is not an exception. He is the determinate sentence rule. I thank you for all your support with regard to changing our judicial system into a just and humane system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And as, as you know, and as we've spoken about before, 1170D is of particular concern to this committee and, and we hope that it can be used more frequently. Uh, the next caller is a phone number, 626-252-8074. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Okay, hi. Good afternoon. My name is Gina Hernandez. I'm a member of Fuel and Initiate Justice and will be reading my husband's letter today. My name is Joe Hernandez and I'm a youth offender. And at the age of 21 in 1993, I was convicted of murder and sentenced to ALWAP. I'm writing to you with the hope that ALWAP will end. When I was going through my trial, it was very difficult. Scared and uneducated, all I could do is shut down. Being sentenced to ALWAP only reinforced my lack of self-worth. ALWAP, the other death penalty, left me feeling hopeless. I concluded that it would take a miracle of God for me to be given a second chance. In 2018, Governor Brown recommended me for commutation, but the California Supreme Court denied it. By the grace of God, I continue to grow and mature. Without any real hope of receiving a second chance, my remorse led me to change. I was determined to do all I can to make amends to all my victims. I've remained disciplinary free for 28 years and I'm working on my degree in sociology. Laws are changing, but youth offender ALWAPs are still being excluded. ALWAP is wrong because it says people are not redeemable. In following our late Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I ask you to not change an old law, but a wrong law. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. I think you're brought to this attention something that we may have not yet discussed as a, as a committee, which is the state constitution has this unusual provision that uh, if you have more than one felony conviction, uh, the governor cannot issue a commutation or pardon without the approval of the majority of the Sup California Supreme Court. So uh, thank you at least for bringing that to, to our attention in your husband's uh, story. Uh, Chris, oh, sorry, uh, Miss. I think we're gonna skip back to Christine Clifford. Christine, are you there now? We can't hear you. I think I'm here now. Oh now? yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanna thank you all for this incredible work. I'm, I'm just so overwhelmed with how, how much this panel has uh, touched on over the past two years, really. And thank you for all your diligent work. Um, I, I do wanna just say that I don't find any moral or fiscal justification for maintaining sentences or enhancements that do nothing to promote public safety and do nothing to rehabilitate and do nothing to deter crime. Um, keeping that lens in mind, I hope when you're looking through all the, the penal codes that you wanna try and revise, you've got a lot of data showing that there's a lot of reasons to change a lot of these laws. And um, although you're pushing towards allowing more and more people to go before the parole board, I certainly hope that you'll also look at why and how to change this very low number of grants for people that are appearing before the parole board. So that's it for me today. And thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, if you heard today, this is, that's a, a, a on, longstanding concern of uh, several people on this committee. Uh, Crystal Lee. Hi, yes, good afternoon. My name is Crystal Lee, and I'll be reading a letter on behalf of Anthony Bridget, who is sentenced to LWAP. The experience and effect LWAP and extreme sentencing has on a person and their family is overwhelming. When a person is sentenced to LWAP because of special circumstances, that is where the unjust is unfair. A lot of circumstances don't warrant LWAP. Changes that would help are more programs groups designed for life without parole inmates. In return, the LWAP inmate can guide others going back to the community to not be repeat offenders. There's only one group that's recently been formed here at Calipatria called LWAP Alliance Group to help achieve insight from an LWAP perspective. As far as the effect it has on one's family, it's a burden that the family doesn't know or understand what kind of help is being provided for their loved one or how to support them. I recommend lawmakers create more programs and groups to help inmates and families 
to grow more positive understanding and that lawmakers revisit the special circumstance penal code. Sincerely, Anthony Bridget. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lay. We really appreciate it. Um, Francisco Perez. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Francisco Perez, and like uh, I was very lucky to be a juvenile life without parole. So I'm reading a letter for Melinda Jones. I am a 66 year old woman who is struggling under extreme sentencing. Specifically life without parole. I was not the perpetrator and yet I was sentenced to die in prison. I program constantly and have even managed to become a state certified drug and alcohol counselor. Others receive milestones and time off credit for the same thing I do, but life without parole is nothing. It is depressing and demoralizing, but I press on in the hope that things will change. I have been incarcerated since 2005 and in prison since 2006. Extreme mandatory sentencing does not take into account the non-perpetrator actual knowledge and involvement. It also does not address the type, the true question of whether someone is an actual danger to society with no chance to prove my worth to a parole board. It is hard to maintain hope and my family no longer has faith in, in our broken justice system. Your help is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Perez. Um, like I said before, I have deep admiration for people who keep on working despite um, hopeless situations. Uh, Joe Mazlish, did I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, I've unmuted, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, some of the efforts that you're making are in a direction that I think we need to go much farther, but I applaud them. The, for example, changing to a 20 year top or um, parole at the end of the base term or ending exclusions of all kinds because shouldn't everyone have a chance? But uh, there's some people who think not as we heard yesterday. Um, I'd like the, you to recommend to the legislature or see if you can do some study of it yourself, a, a question that has a lot in it and I think will allow us to move along. What justifies or what obliges a community to impose on someone the significant uh, restriction of human rights that's involved in custody? What is it? Not just what does the law say it is, but actually to confront that and have a transparent open discussion in society and of course in the various elements of government. Um, that I think will move us along. Uh, sure, there will be disagreements and it won't be resolved easily, but at least to confront that. You're confronting it indirectly and without direct discussion in every one of these attempts to get these changes and, and to work with the legislature on them. What, it, what does justify that? I believe the public safety only is the justification and it has to be viewed in terms of Mr. what's going Mainslish, on in the communities. Yes. I'm yes, going to cut you off. I'm sorry. I'm Fair just trying enough. to get through as many people as possible. I can possible. write you. I, I can write please you. Thank do. you so much. Please do. You've really encouraged my own thinking in the work that you're doing. Thank you. All right. The, the, the next uh, person to speak is from Fair Chance Project. Hey, this is Jerry Silva. And oh, hi, Jerry. Hi. I'm reading a letter on behalf of Ronnell Ross. On August 3rd, 2021, I will be in prison in California for 45 years. I've been sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. In 78, at the young age of 22, I made a terrible life altering mistake. Believing I was protecting my home from intruders, I shot and killed an undercover, plainclothes policeman. I have regretted this mistake ever since. Of course, I apologize for the grief and suffering I've caused his family members, my own family members, and others who have been negatively impacted. I was a poster boy for what a good American should be, but I was a Black American. It was 1978 and I was living in Stockton, California. Over the years, I've lost every living family member I had. 
My mother was my last hope and she left me in 2008. The feeling of loneliness is difficult to convey unless you have felt something like it. I have seen many men succumb to despair and commit suicide in one form or another. I've also seen men who are my friends go home to live a life away from the gun tower. Miss Silva, I, 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 need, I, I need to cut you off uh, okay. there. And on that opti somewhat optimistic note, I also wanna just recognize publicly, you and I have known each other for a long time and I wanna just acknowledge and, and say how much I admire that how long and hard you've worked for folks behind bars. So thank you very much for everything that you've done and do. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Quay. Hello, uh, my name is Quay and I'll be reading portions of a letter from Leif Ferguson serving an LWAP sentence in Valley State Prison. To whom may concern, I am currently serving a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. I have been incarcerated for 28 years. Being incarcerated for this length of time has been very challenging especially knowing that no matter how much I rehabilitate myself, I will never have the opportunity to present my personal transformation to the Board of Prison Hearings. Many of us sentenced to LWAP have made dramatic efforts to change and give back to communities, despite the fact that for all intents and purposes, there is no tangible incentive to do so, other than it is the right thing to do. I do not wish to come across as somehow justifying my or others past profoundly negative actions, nor do I wish to convey that we are somehow entitled to special treatment. That person I was over 25 years ago rightly was sent to prison for his deeds. But if given the opportunity, I think many LWAP inmates like myself would present themselves to the world as having become changed for the better because they truly have. It is my great hope that we are afforded that opportunity to go to the parole board just like, uh, just like other life inmates and prove ourselves to be changed people and, give, uh, and given a second chance at life in the world outside these prison walls. Thank you for lending me your ear and your time. Uh, Leif D. Perkinson from Valley State Prison. Thank you. Thank you, Quay. Um, the next person is a telephone number 209-322-6769. I think you're on mute. There you go. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you now, yes. Oh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, my name's Linda and I will be reading a letter. Hi, I'll be, okay, I'll be reading a letter on behalf of Ricky Godfrey. Um, it says, to whom it may concern, extreme sentencing such as life without parole affects me and my family in the most emotional and psychological of ways. The thought of having to spend the rest of my life inside a prison with no chance of ever having a parole hearing to evaluate the changes I have made as I evolved into manhood and out of boyhood, since the message of my life does not have any meaning. My family and I often worry if our flight of an unjust sentence will ever change. Even when I embrace the opportunity presented to me to self-educate and rehabilitate myself so that I enhance the opportunity, so, so that I am a better person, every effort of the positive progress seems to go unnoticed in the eyes of the system. It's like we build our hopes up high just to have it all come crashing down by the system. It's like we build our hopes up high just to have it all come crashing down. Linda, uh, the disappointing thank you. News Linda, are I'm sorry. I'm, is that life without pearl? Yes. Linda, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but th thank you very much for no, it's okay. your contribution yes. in reading the letter. We, we do enjoy hearing, or okay. we, we appreciate it. Uh, Gail Kendall. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Gail Kendall with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners reading written testimony from Eileen Huber. I will read excerpts from her letter as follows. I was arrested a few months after I turned 19 years old. I arrived to prison and turned 20 years old with no hope of leaving prison. I had not taken life, but I did not have the bravery to attempt trying to stop someone I loved from killing. That was my reality. Skipping forward, over the years, I have completed every step on the rehabilitation roadmap. 
at the conclusion of each class, I get a reminder that I will receive no credit because I am an Elwha. I tried to move to the prison down south to be closer to friends. I'm ineligible because I'm an LWAP. I tried to apply for joint venture, but told no, I'm ineligible because I am an LWAP. The juvenile law changed acknowledging that the human brain is not mature at 19, and that is before its growth is stunted by drugs. That fact does not matter if you're an LWAP. Skipping forward. A sentence should not change facts. If I am a juvenile offender, that is a fact. If I can prove rehabilitation, that is a fact. If I'm low level risk, I should be able to transfer. I want to see LWAPs receive all the same rights and privileges as lifers. Eileen. Thank you, Th thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kendall. We appreciate it. Um, Maria Ricard. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, did I pronounce your name correctly? Ricarte, yeah. Hi, my Ricarte. name is Maria Ricarte. Uh, father formerly in prison by three strikes, leading cyclically to my brother currently in prison as a youth offender, charged as an adult. I'll be, written, I'll be reading testimony on behalf of Mr. Jasper Stallings. Quote, I have a sentence of 127 years. 70 of those years are because of gun enhancements. There's no possible way I can do that much time. Every day I see people who have more time for enhancements than for the actual crime they were convicted of. The gun enhancements do not necessarily fight, fight crime. They are a way to get people like myself, a black man, more time away from our families. I understand there is punishment in the system. However, giving me and other people additional time causes us to lose our families over the enhancements. Enhancements over each and everything does not solve the problem. Instead, enhancements... Hello, Maria? Ms. McCarthy? You're on mute, Sentence Maria. Sentence enhancements do not go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We missed some of what you said, but please make sure that the letter is submitted to us. Will do, thank you. All right. Uh, and finally, uh, Ronald Johnson. Hello, can you hear me? We, yes, we can. Okay, hi. My name is Ron Johnson. I'm a member of the uh, California Attorneys for Criminal Justice Legislative Committee and a liaison for the work of this committee on behalf of CACJ. I've been a deputy public defender for the past 16 years uh, and began this work at a time when mass incarceration policies were near their peak. Um, and I per personally witnessed both uh, the harms that it's caused to the community and on a hope more hopeful note, the gradual progression away from some of the worst of those policies. Uh, I know firsthand how important it is to keep up that work because there's still a lot more to do. I just wanted to comment on the importance of the work of this committee in that process and hope that CACJ can play a role in that work. Uh, thank you for your work on criminal justice policy and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm available to answer any questions that the committee has any for me. Well, thank you, Mr. Johnson. We really do appreciate uh, everything that CACJ does and uh, we hope that you guys will uh, you know, contribute and comment to uh, the reports and the recommendations that, that we publish. So thank you all, thank you all. Oh, we have one last person. Uh, last but not least, Colby Lenz. Thanks so much, Mike. Sorry, I was rushing over from another meeting. No, sorry. Um, my name is Colby Lenz. I'm an advocate with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners and Survived and Punished. Um, we have sent concrete recommendations, but I wanted to mention a few things after observing this week's meetings. Please. Thank you all so much for your time and commitments. I wanted to respond briefly to comments made yesterday by the DA representative, Michelle Hannessy. DA Hannessy used the term, quote, cunning to describe why women are disproportionately prosecuted with certain special circumstances like lying in wait. She used the racially disparate stereotypical idea that women are weak and thus have to resort to, quote, cunning, others to have them commit crimes. This stereotype aligns with how prosecutors use gendered tropes such as masterminds, conspirators, sexual manipulators um, to paint women somehow as both simultaneously subordinate and hyper culpable to shape narratives that lead to a presumption of guilt. The bar they have to meet to argue culpability for special circumstances is incredibly low. Because the DA could not rely on facts, she relied on gender stereotypes to justify life without parole convictions secured through gendered stereotypes. It was a circular sexist logic not dissimilar to the circular racist logics that Mike Reynolds used in an attempt to defend the racist application of three strikes law, which is of course indefensible. 
She also argued that just because special circumstances might be unfairly prosecuted in a small number of cases doesn't make that unfair overall. It seems she was compelled to say that, at least in part because of the compelling testimony yesterday by Susan Bustamante and Jarrett Harper, who both shared how evidence of their victimization was not allowed or submitted to court. When we look at patterns of prosecution and patterns in the AWAP population, we see that the problems are in fact systematic and systemic um, and not unusual. We see that with the 80% of people being people of color sentenced to AWAP and so on. And lastly, just a quick word on commutations. As an argument against the need to overhaul extreme sentencing, including LWAP, I've noticed that prosecutors in the last few weeks in relation to legislation about LWAP as well are now saying, well, you can get, you can get commuted from LWAP if your case is egregious. And so we don't need to make any you know, uh, more transformative changes. I wanna be sure to share that prosecutors are saying this while they're busy opposing commutation applications. So that argument is in bad faith and it doesn't add up because clemency, while incredibly important is politically fraught and the numbers that we do have for LWAP uh, were largely you know, created by that uh, swell during Governor Brown's time. Um, so eliminate LWAP please. And also second look, yes, but, but that would only make sense if people had a proper first look and the administration- um, Ms. There Lenz, was, oops. Yeah. <laughs> we really appreciate it. I'm just trying to keep it okay, fair okay, okay. to everybody else. You're the last speaker, so you know I can't say there are other people behind you, but uh, I do wanna keep it fair. Please do, as with everybody, uh, the, the most, the best way to get substantive recommendations before the committee is to write uh, to us, uh, email or send letters. Um, we do do hold the public comment, not just because we're required to do so, but because to hear the voices, I think does matter and does move us. Um, so thank you all for contributing. Uh, we're gonna take a short break um, before we uh, move on to our discussion and vote on the death penalty. So can we, uh, yes, Senator Skinner, before we go. I'm just conscious that we have, I think it's uh, Judge Moreno who has the meeting at 4.30. So I didn't know whether we should just continue. I, I need five minutes. So if we could continue at four o'clock and hopefully within we can, can conclude our business by 4.30. Is that gonna work for you, Judge Justice Moreno? Well, whether it works or not, I'm signing off. I'm sharing the other meeting and it's equally important. <laughs> okay. So, well, I, I, need, I need the break. So uh, mm -hmm. let's, Get back, uh, reconvene at four o'clock sharp and uh, move uh, swiftly. All right. All right, thank you.
All right, I know it's a few minutes before four, but trying to keep respect for Justice Moreno's time and all of ours, it's the end of a long day and week. Uh, if people could come back if they're back at their chairs. Uh, Mike, I think you'd have a quorum anyway without me. If you, if you need a vote, I can vote by proxy too, if you like. We do, I'm not sure, I, I, hopefully we can vote. This is an important one and I'd like us all to be there if we can, especially, you know, so let's try. I mean, we'll, if need be, we'll, we'll resort to something like that, but um, hopefully uh, Senator Skinner and Assembly Member Lee can join us. Let's give them a minute because I am a minute early. <sighs> All right, uh, I want to keep us right on time. There we go. Hi, Senator. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, the purpose of this final uh, part of our meeting is to vote uh, on recommendations regarding the death penalty in California. Um, I know that we've had some new members with us uh, since we heard from the, from the death penalty. Um, and I wanna give you, uh, uh, Assembly Member Lee, I forget, were you with us for the death penalty conversation? Yes, I was. Yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, Professor Ochin, because you weren't with us, although I hope that you've read our materials and reviewed this, and I presume it's not a new issue for you, uh, but if you would choose to recuse yourself from this vote, that was perfectly uh, understandable. I, I choose not to. I've, I've had a chance to review the hearing and review the materials. I'm prepared to vote. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so um, in some ways, this is a, a, a very consequential vote, I think, from the committee. At the same time, as with um, almost all the issues that we've discussed today, um, there's not much that the legislature itself can do with regard to the death penalty. Um, this would require uh, a vote of the people. Nonetheless, I think um, uh, a statement on the death penalty from this committee is important. Also, um, it is one of the most complicated and most studied uh, areas, if not the most er studied area in American criminal law and California law in particular. We had tremendous experts and I think great research, um, not only by, the, by uh, the witnesses who appeared before us, but by committee staff who I hope also answered the questions that were raised by committee members um, at the end of our last meeting. Um, and to uh, your all your satisfaction. I don't know if folks want to discuss it, but I would move that we vote as a committee to recommend that the death penalty in California be abolished. Does it require a second? Yeah, I would like, well, it would be helpful. Right. Question. Of course. So your intention with the motion is that we that be our recommendation with silence on on the next steps or how or whatever i here's here's my proposal so i would suggest correct a clean vote um, on whether or not the death penalty in california should be repealed for whatever reason we each may have our different reasons why um it should be repealed i would then i'm going to ask there's a number of um suggestions that policymakers can in, in the memo, in the staff memo, to reduce the size of death row, because the size of death row, I think, is uh, unmanageable from a number of different perspectives. I would suggest, unless others on the committee feel differently, that we do not necessarily endorse specifics on how to reduce the size of the current death row, but instead say um, that, um, every effort should be made to reduce the current size of death row. And here are some examples without specifically endorsing those proposals. So to summarize, I would suggest first an initial vote on whether the death penalty should be repealed or abolished in California. 
for whatever reason, then I would ask for a vote on whether or not policymakers should um, engage in efforts to reduce the size of death row, period. And then our report would have some examples. I also want to remember, remind everyone that although these will be the, the, the formal votes of the committee, we will then publish a report which we will all vote on once that's prepared. Does that follow? Does that does anybody have any questions logistically before we vote? Does anybody, Senator? Um, the I, I can realize it may be difficult to give the rationale, but I didn't know whether well I it may benefit the committee ultimately in terms of our, the report that we issue. Um, providing some background as to the rationale. Our, the report will be extensive and I think we'll give multiple reasons. Uh, I think we all come, we may come at this from different perspectives about why the death penalty should be abolished. I think what the important piece is or that what I, what I propose that the committee um, do is, is we have a unanimous, that we are hopefully unanimous, but that we have a clear um, statement on the abolition of the death penalty. And that there be a myriad of reasons why one may oppose the death penalty and, pri and different priorities among those reasons for difference of the, among us. Um, our report, I think, will be excellent as our, as our past reports have been. I think it will include new research, new data, updates from the last time any state agency has um, made any recommendations on the death penalty, updates since last uh, public uh, votes on the death penalty in Proposition 66. So I think it will be actually, uh, I, I hope, well, we're working hard to make it, um, to, to contribute to the conversation, um, including different rationales that people, so that's well, what so I would suggest. I, and, that, and that we is together would in, in, right. uh, also vote uh, to support the, the, the report once it's completed. So I don't object to that. I just think that the value of our process, yeah. I mean, we, we are, obviously we all hold uh, opinions and we, and we are, and those are legitimate. However, our appointment to this process was to review a set of, well, to process these things and not solely and only, while certainly we must exercise our opinions, our values and our, but not solely and only to. And so that I just feel like the value going forward is going to be the substance of the report in addition, obviously, to our vote. I agree. And I think the report will be excellent and be powerful, I hope. Um, I guess what I wanted to try to avoid was wordsmithing a particular statement um, that would capture all of our opinions about this in a accurate and concise way. We can try to do that, but I, I actually thought it would be cleaner. Well, then why don't we do it as the vote as you suggested, but later before we adopt the report, we can obviously review the language in the report to ensure that it communicates the, the differing uh, more than just personal views, but factual and other um, data that, uh, that we have felt to be compelling. Absolutely, that, that, that was my intention completely. Um, and one, what, the report will be a draft. Right, that's before, before it's published, before it's endorsed, before we sign off on it, it will be a draft. And we can work on that together um, once we get that in front of us. But I thought as a first step to formally uh, just vote uh, on a clean question about whether or not the death penalty should be repealed uh, would be a cleaner way to go at this, at this juncture. Um, so I'd like to renew my uh, request that we vote to that the California's death penalty uh, should be abolished. And could I have another second? Uh, my second, yes. second. Thank you. So all, all in favor of, of that the death penalty should be repealed? 
Aye. 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 All right. All right. So I'm I'm glad that we were able to come to that consensus and uh, unanimously uh, agree that the death penalty should be repealed. As we were just discussing with Senator Skinner, we will publish. We will. The staff is currently working on, and we will prepare a very thorough and I think compelling uh, report justifying and explaining the various rationale that we may have. Um, and that will be forthcoming. Um, the second vote I would like to take is that we would like to encourage policymakers to reduce the current, the size of current death row, but again, without making specific uh, recommendations on how that might be accomplished. So in the uh, staff memo, there were legislative proposals, there's clemency, there's the attorney general's role in litigation. There's lots of different ways that the current death row might be uh, reduced. Um, and my instinct is that um, because we haven't studied each of these issues directly, that to, to endorse each one up or down isn't quite, in the spirit of, of, the, of the way that we've been conducting at least this uh, part of our research. So I would prefer to say that we encourage policymakers and lawmakers to do their utmost to reduce the size of death row and include various different examples without necessarily um, endorsing this, any of the specifics. Does that make sense? Do people have questions about that? Um, yeah, I, I would just, I guess, ask Senator Skinner and Assemblymember Lee if that's helpful uh, to get sort of a general recommendation of that nature um, without a clear indication of our thoughts on the wisdom, the practicality, the e efficacy of any of the options that we may um, describe. It's a very good question. Um, to me, the, va the value of, the, of our process and our committee is to provide that kind of rationale. Um, because without it, then obviously any of us legislators can put something forward, but then we are just left to try to find entities across the state to either uh, join with us in such an effort. But I think that our, the value of, of our adding an imprimatur to it or whatever is to is providing, like I said, some uh, rationale for it. Otherwise, it it's like just a position. Well, okay, so we could go through each of the proposals that are in the um, staff memo. They're not all to the legislature, some are to the governor and to the attorney general, for example. Um, or we could merely provide those as examples of things that could be done without specifically endorsing each one. I thought it would be more efficient to do the latter, but I'm happy to go through each one. I, I, yeah. I guess, curious what other people think. No, I'm, I'm happy to adopt the, the different you know, ways that are, are suggested in the staff memo. I mean, they all have merit. Uh, they should be studied. Uh, so the basic concept of the memo that we got, I, I'm perfectly happy with each of the suggestions that are made in there. Maybe then the wording of the motion be something a little different, more like based on based on the data reviewed and the the um, op uh, the options for uh, for modification to current death row sentences that committee votes to, to uh, recommend these things be pursued. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I support all of the recommendations um, to what, what I'm calling reducing the size of, of death row. Um, if people feel comfortable with that, I think that that's even better and stronger. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully okay. staff uh, got that motion without my having to reword it. Well, I'll, 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 can I reword it and just say, 
that do uh, uh, motion to adopt the recommendations in the memo to reduce the size of death row in California. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. All right. So I move to adopt the recommendations in the memo to reduce the size of death row in California. A second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Anybody opposed? All right. Thank you. Um, obviously, this is a really important issue, and I'm glad that we've made taken this step um, to recommend abolishing the death penalty itself, I think, is significant. Um, and I'm glad that we we're able also to embrace these recommendations, um, many of which I think are novel and haven't been considered before. So I'm glad about that. And I hope, obviously, to make real progress on this really intractable issue. And um, and, and thank you for your time. We've had two long days um, and I really appreciate everybody. This is a highlight of you know what I do. And so thank you so much. Welcome again to Professor Ochin. And um, I'm sure I will see you all around. Have a great weekend. And thank right. you to everybody in the public and the audience. We really do appreciate that uh, you follow along with us. Uh, ha have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, Mike. Bye. Thank you. Bye.